When we open up the word today in 1 Timothy in the sixth chapter, it does remind us too why we are here, praising God for all the blessings and all the benefits. I invite you to turn in the New Testament in that first letter of Timothy in the sixth chapter. You can find in the Pew Bible as well. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, open up that Pew Bible to 198 in the New Testament. And there you'll find that sixth chapter of Timothy. And I turn then to the 17th verse. And I invite us all to open up our hearts and our minds to receive the gift of the word. As for those in the present age who are rich, he writes, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Enjoying and having that life that really is life, he ends that section with. Reminds us why we're here today. We're all here, too, to grow closer to Christ, to grow more and more into the disciples of Jesus, so that every, every year, every season of our lives, we've matured more in the faith. We've become more into the likeness of Christ, just desiring that. Desiring to live as Christ calls us to live, to be more and more the disciple, whom we know that God sees through Christ within us, and just to let it reflect out through our daily living, through our patterns of life, so that we can come into that full enjoyment of life that really is life. That's where Jesus shows us to be, in that place where we find that. Because we long, we seek for how to have that enjoyment in life and pleasure in life and, and, and just enjoy this, the simple beauties like of this fresh new day. And we say thank you, God, for that. Enjoying life in all of its beauty. Jesus shows us about that and calls us into it. So seek to be that disciple he calls you to be, forming your life more and more into the likeness of Christ. Jesus showed us about this thing about generosity, and he reflects that in his life. When we learn about Christ through the New Testament and the readings of, as well as your personal relationship with Christ, we realize how generosity was such a core in his teaching, as well as in his living. So that Jesus not only taught these principles, but he lived them out. And he showed us through his example how to be generous people. Just imagine all of the ways in which Jesus was so very generous with people. Generous with the time that he would give to people who others would reject and not give them the time of day. Jesus would stop and spend time with people generously. Jesus would be generous with God's blessings in their lives like the little children coming to him and sitting upon his lap. Generosity of a blessing given. When others said, no, they need to know their place and move along, Jesus would call them to him and bless them. How generous was Jesus in the healing of, of God's blessings on life and healing those who were on the outside of the community like the lepers. And Jesus welcomed them to the inside and healed them. The generous spirit of Jesus was contagious showing us the very generous heart of God. We desire to walk after and in the footsteps of Jesus and to reflect that kind of a generosity. So we are here on a Sunday morning to be challenged in our ways of living, in our discipleship, in our walk. That's what the scriptures will do to us, is they'll challenge us in how we're living it out and not living it out. It's part of our worship time together is a bit of this struggle that is there even, the times in which we just sing our praises to God and know of all of the blessings and the bounty in which we live, and then also to confess the ways that we're not quite there and ask Jesus to encourage us, challenge us onward in our lives, individually in this very room, but corporately too as a whole body of faith, that Jesus continues to challenge us in how we're reflecting the very Gospels and not reflecting them. So a time when we look at God's generosity, it feels good. It's a good place to be. 
recognizing the blessings that are so bountiful, plentiful. We recognize that God has gifted it all to us so very, very much. It's as though the more we begin to see the blessings and count them, the more that there are, and they become innumerable, so much that we're just overflowing with the blessings. That's that gift. When we start living into it and looking for and recognizing that God blesses us so much, the more we see those blessings at every moment and every opportunity. It's a good thing. It's a blessed place to be in life. In the Old Testament, so many ways in which we're reminded that all things are from God. In Leviticus, in chapter 25, verse 23, it speaks of the ways in which even the land we say and we claim, God says is mine. This is my gift, the land. And it's the land in which you are tenants of, even like aliens. Uh, tenants and, and, and those who I offer and give to freely. But no, that as tenants, it means that we don't own it. It's God's. And that's that rightful connection and relationship with God then, knowing that who God is and who we are as God's children, that we are here because God has gifted us life and placed us in this wonderful garden and said, what I want you to do is to take care of it and tend it like stewards who need to watch over it and make it and help it to multiply. How do we help the garden to multiply but we keep sharing it? God offers us his generosity and then we pass it along to others and we keep sharing it as though we're just this channel of God's generosity and we keep offering it to others so that it just grows in our lives, in the lives of others, in all ways. And we live in this movement of God's generous grace given to us through Christ who shows us how to do just that and be just that. But we start in that very place in that place of acknowledging that all that we have is a gift from God, that God is the, the one who's the landlord. He's the one who has it all. We don't own a thing. But God just blesses us with, here it is. Take it and use it. And trusts us with it then. So in the Old Testament, we're taught ways in which to have then helpful, have that right relationship with the property and with all that God has blessed us, with all that we have, which sometimes we slip into places of thinking we own it all, and it's mine, mine, and we hold on to it. And so in the Old Testament, we're taught these ways of helping ourselves to keep in a right relationship with all these things and all the property and all that we have and enjoy. And it bridges then into the New Testament where Jesus teaches us these same principles then in order to keep in the right frame of mind, in the right relationship with all these blessings, we are called to participate in giving. We're called to participate in giving in which Abraham first was teaching us as the father of the faith. In the Old Testament, Abraham would teach, what you do is you receive, uh, you, you receive all this bounty and then you return 10% of it to the Lord's hand. And that helps keep you in the right kind of balance, the right kind of relationship within teaching us that principle that's there. Jesus reflected that ways of the giving and that ways of the generosity from God then to others as well. But it raises that question then, well, why is it that we would give? Why is it that we're called to do so? Throughout all of scripture in so many places, it commands us even, give. And that tithe that's there, that 10%, what is that about and why? Does God need it? What does that do to God when we give? Why does God call us to give unto him? Well, the practice that was happening was that the priests would receive the offerings, the offerings that would come in the animals and in the, and in the, the, the crops, the harvest that would come in, and they would bring them and place them onto the altar, and they would burn them. They would burn them, and the, and the, the smoke and the, the incense basically would go on up to heaven and go right into the nostrils of God, the scriptures say. And God would take enjoyment in that. Well, I'm kind of literal about this, God. What does that mean, that you enjoy a good barbecue? You mean you just enjoy it when we just have a roast and, and all that goes up to heaven and you just enjoy it? Is that, is that what, it's, what it's saying that's, that's there, that, that, that we just offer these burnt offerings to you and that's what makes you, oh God, pleased with us and with things? Well, we look more closely at that and what it's calling us to do is to give. To give and God sees that happening. Not that God needs that. Not that God needs that sacrifice that's there of the burnt offerings go, but that God wants to know, do you trust me? Do you love me? Give. 
It's a call to loving relationship with God. That I acknowledge, oh God, that all that I have is from you. It's a gift. And I thank you, God. I thank you for this wonderful gift. Here is my praise offering of praise and thanksgiving, and I just lift it to you. What God wants is your heart. God wants your spirit. God wants to know that indeed you have acknowledged and received that we have the wonderful gift. And we say, I know it all comes from you, God, and I thank you for that. God wants to know where we are in our relationship together and to be confirmed with that. And in that way, we're brought into life because that's what God wants for you, for all of us, is this life that really is life, like 1 Timothy says. God wants you to have that, to know that. And so he wants us to know that we don't want to be trapped with these possessions. We don't want it to be that life comes from the things that we have and all these bountiful gifts that we have. But life comes from the very gift of God in us. And, for, and this relationship that we enjoy with God, that's where life is found. And that brings pleasure to God. That brings that, 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 that smiling heart from God, that, that way of, that, that, that God just glows and glories in. Why does God call us to give? So that it grows our relationship with God. And we are one with, one with our God. But there's this other part of giving then that the scriptures seem to reflect as well, that it echoes here in 1 Timothy. There's a need that we have to give. So what does giving do for us when we participate in that? Does, why do you give? Why are we called to give? There's something within us then that when we give, it shapes us in our spirits. As we participate in God's generous gift to us by offering it to others and channeling that generosity and giving generously to others, it does something with us, in our own spirits, in our own lives. We know that as we participate in giving to another who has a need, there's a way in which we talk about it like it just gives me a warm feeling, or it just gives me that feeling and that experience of it's well. I, I, I just have a, a glow about it, and I, that, that's that expression that we have in the ways that we're talking about it. It's trying to put into words something that's happening within us. As we give, connections begin to happen that we have with God, but then with others as well. And in this connection that we begin to have with others as we give and reflect God's generosity and offer it to others, our relationships grow stronger and healthier. They grow in a way that, uh, that they reflect the very, the very gift of life that God gives us. And your relationships then blossom. That's what's happening as we express and share in God's generosity and we're giving to others, is our relationships begin to reflect the very life given to us by God, and it grows in that. And as we give and participate in the generosity, we become free, free from the bond and the bondage that possessions claim on us. We all know what that is, that we can live in, in order to be, where we kind of become enslaved to the things that we have and the accumulation and thinking that's where life is found. That is a model that our culture and world gives. Life is found in the giving and the sacrificing and the blessings that we offer to others because we have first been blessed by our God. It's this movement that God begins and we share in it and participate in it. David Sagal, a pastor in the uh, southeastern part of the United States, uh, it was Adam Hamilton in his book, Enough, which many of you are reading right now, tells of this uh, illustration that Pastor Sago gives. It's an illustration about apples that you may have wondered, why apples up on the table today? Because they remind us of the bounty of God, for one. They remind us of, of the gift that God has given us in the garden, that everything is going to be provided. And when you know everything is going to be provided by our God, and God will watch over and have you in the palm of his hand, it frees us. It frees us from needing to be um, so concerned about whether I'll have enough or not that I'm reluctant to give. So knowing that we are in God's care and God provides all frees us to be able to give. It just opens us up that we know that we do have enough. In fact, we have more than enough. We have an abundance. The apples remind us that God provides all things for us beautifully. 
richly and to enjoy because an apple is something that when we eat and when we have it, not only does it nourish our bodies, not only does it feed us, but it gives us pleasure. We enjoy it. You can see in that First Timothy passage that we're called to enjoy the pleasures given to us by God, the blessings, the bounty. Enjoy them. Have them. And just, just, just say, thank you, God, so much for the beautiful, delicious blessing that you've given me. Whatever it may be. The apples are for us that delicious blessing. And we can enjoy it and partake of it and know that we're provided for. God takes care of us. And we can just enjoy it. And so God says, here it all is. And what I ask you to do is to discover how to live within nine of the ten apples. Take those nine of the ten apples and know that all of that is, means that your needs are provided. Within the nine apples, I'm going to make sure then you have the food you need, the clothing you need, the shelter you need, and the education, the health care, uh, uh, the, the vacations, and, and the going out to dinner and all that. You take care of that within the nine that I give. Because we remember, first of all, that all ten are a gift from God. Everything is a gift from God that we enjoy. So the nine that are there, we live within, and we just enjoy them. And God says to us, this 10th apple, this 10th apple that's there, what I call upon you to do is to give it, give it away. I want you to give it away that in a way that glorifies me. So I want you to give it as an offering that acknowledges that all good things come from me. And I want you to take that 10th apple and not only give it, give it to glorify me, but do it through. What did Jesus say to do? But to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and to take care of the widowed. And when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We glorify God by giving to those in need, by sharing the generosity that God has offered to us. God says, just take that one and do that with it. Share in my generosity with others. But what our hungry hearts too easily do with that 10th apple is we find other things that we could have and enjoy. And we think, you know, God wouldn't miss it a whole lot if I just took one bite out of this apple for myself. If I just took one little bite out of it for, you know, that extra, I, I didn't realize that the air conditioner was gonna go out and I spent my emergency fund on something else. So God wouldn't mind, would he, you know, that I took care of that one tenth part, you know, and just used it for that, or that, that, that another opportunity came along in and, and, and a car that is so, oh, it, the value of it is just enormous, and I get, it, I, I get it for a song, and, and, and God wouldn't mind if I took advantage of this really screaming deal that would be a wonderful car that we could have in our family that would help us so much in so many ways, and, and I know I didn't take care of that in the other nine apples, but would God mind if I took a bite out of that one and just took care of that need that we have? It's a real need that's there, and it would be nice to have. Or, or sometimes we even take a bite out of that apple that does other kind of things, like a splashing vacation that we really would love to take. And we use that apple for that. And we take a bite out of it, and another bite, and another bite. And then what we have is kind of a core left. And we put that on the altar and say, well, that's what's left, God, out of that 10th apple. Well, God understands that challenge that we each have with the desires and the enjoyments of life. He understands how much we just love all the blessings that he gives to us and just want to eat it all up and enjoy it all. But he calls us to make note of that, just to notice, are we in that right relationship with the things that we have? And are we sidestepping something that is so important and valuable to us? And that is participating in generosity. Have we, have we eliminated ourselves then from participating in this great, incredible joy that God knows so beautifully? And that joy of giving, that joy of blessing another person with, with what they need in a way that lets them know you're cared for, you're loved. I notice that you have a need. Here it is fulfilled. That helps us to be in the right relationship with other other things. Do we cut that opportunity off by chomping into that tenth apple? Well, I'll acknowledge that 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 tithe that that Adam that 
Abraham taught the people to have. Take one-tenth and all. And we move on into the New Testament, which, which we're not legalistic about then because Jesus frees us from that. But what Jesus brings us to is from a place of obligation to say that I have to because my soul is dependent upon giving that 10% tithe. Jesus said, no, it's not. No, I paid that price already. It's a free gift to you, this gift of your soul and eternal life. But it becomes a choice for us. And there's a difference then when it's transformed from a have-to obligation into a personal decision and choice. What am I going to do with all the bounty which, which God has given me? How am I going to respond? We each have a choice about how we're living. Can I make it so that I can live within the nine apples? I can do that. It takes some practice. It takes some initiative. It takes some decision making and to stepping into it to making it happen. But certainly I can live within the nine and then be able to share in that tenth glorious apple of generosity. But it takes some practice to do that. You remember a, a woman that Jesus was observing? He had other people around him, and she came into the temple courtyards, an elderly woman, a widow, he said, and there she had the little that she had in hand, and she put it into the offerings there, into that courtyard at the temple. And Jesus exemplified her, lifted her up, and said, she has given all that she has. That woman who gave all that she had, she did it out of a joyful heart, out of a personal choice that was hers. She went well beyond the 10th apple, and she was blessed by it in ways that are immeasurable, in ways that we do not know. That's her personal connection with God and that personal calling and choice that she was having to give so much, she would be blessed so much through that. Well, that gift that she gave, did she wake up that day and that was the first time she offered such an extravagant gift? I can only imagine that she grew into it through years and years of practicing it, through stepping one step at a time toward really, truly being generous. It takes practice to do that. It even, in a sense, takes a lifetime of it. So within that older woman is this faithful child of God who just sought to reflect God's generosity with her whole being and her whole spirit. And she grew her lifetime to that very place, that pinnacle of her life, which just imaged that all of God's generosity, which she was saying to God, I know it's all yours, God, and I trust you with it, with my own life. That's a faithful place to be, trusting God with every bit of it and acknowledging that it really truly all does come from God. She was in that ripe, mature place. So I, so I put before us today that prayer for yourself, that prayer that just says, oh God, how am I living? How is it that I can live within the nine so that I can give at least a part of the tenth apple, at least something, and to start taking some growth steps for yourself about participating in generosity in a way that you've never done before and find out how true that teaching has been all the way from the days of Abraham through today and how Jesus has taught us it's more blessed to give than to receive. Try it out. Step into it just a bit at a time. If you're not yet ready there to go all the way to that 10th apple in its completeness, at least take a look at some of it. Take a step closer to that fullness of generosity. Pray over that. Struggle with it. I am challenged with it. And I keep on every year saying, oh, Lord, how are you calling me to be more faithful and more complete with that? Struggle with it. Let it make you uncomfortable a bit. Let God make us uncomfortable a bit in that. And bring us to this beautiful place that maybe you've never been before. And you'll discover, wow, God, you are so generous, and I can see why. Because that's where life is really life and living.
God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than 